I'll start up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and of you, O Lord, you are our light to shine upon those who are in darkness, and may be illumined upon our mind, and may recover their sight. Let your face now shine upon us, and we shall be illumined by you, walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mary, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 So, what we're actually doing here is we're going to spend a little bit of time that we started last week by talking about fasting. Because fasting is an absolutely universal practice in the history of mankind. Every culture, everyone has, everyone has had the experience and the knowledge that fasting is something which is not just simply healthy, but it has consciousness or spiritual benefit to it, just on a purely psychological level, which is why I began last week. We mentioned there's four points here. The first point we started covering on, on the aspect of the ascesis, Ascane, so the training aspect of that everyone recognizes it as. So Ascane, so we had that last week, the Greek verb for training, which is where we get our word then as a noun, Ascesis, so the, the, the training. And as I said, this is very universal. And so on the psychological level, we've got four points, and then I'm going to talk on... The doctrine of the two spirits, the Yesherim, which is very much linked to the Essenes, and we'll talk to, about them a little bit. Then we'll come back to the actual directives of the patriarch. Because I'm afraid that what happens is, is when you get a letter like this, especially if you've never heard it. We can't read that. That oh, was from last week, A-S-K-E-I-N. It's the same word, yeah. Okay. All right, Askane. So, I'm afraid that when we get a list of directives like this, especially if we haven't seen them or heard of them ever before, we just kind of go, oh, we either get overwhelmed by them and just ignore them because they're overwhelming, or we just ignore them because it's new. But in fact, it's not new. It is what we have been doing since the beginning and more. What you have in this letter is actually pretty much what dates from um, the early 18th century, the practices from the early 1700s. All right, so last time we left off with that first just purely psychological, these are just purely psychological arguments on fasting. And the first one being is that why would any culture, any religion, any philosophy fast? It's primarily about training towards some form of action, some form of ethical, moral behavior. And again, moral purely in the, what the word means of uh, behavior. We use the word moral as always meaning good behavior. But the word moral actually just simply, from most moris in Latin, most is a behavior or a received manner of acting. Sometimes it's translated as custom. Most. And so most moris. So the adjective moralis means then an action which is the received way of acting. And so again, in English, we've made it into good behavior, moral. But moral just in itself means that we're training. So even just pure on a psychological level, we will have some kind of a discipline that will be done, some kind of training, a species, which is always going to have some kind of goal of something which us to train a behavior. All right? And we gave, I gave, finished off by giving the example, even as simple as you do not give the cookie to your two-year-old before 
dinner because you know that it ruins appetites. And so you're going to have a full plate of peas because they ate two cookies beforehand. So you make them make the training, the ascasis of saying no. And then you have to put up with the howling <laughs> and the antagonistic look. But you've been trained also to do that because you know that the behavior, your training is such that you're helping this little one come out of their immaturity, which is we talked about. The whole meaning of the word education is a duchere, to lead them out of a duchere, to lead them out of immaturity towards maturity. But of course, if you haven't been trained on that, and you don't have that discipline, you throw the cookie at the kid just to shut him up. And you begin at that point a whole life process of horrors. Because then your child is never trained, and when he's 16 and can look you in the eye, he's not going to do anything. At two, you can at least pick them up. <laughs> when they're 18, you can't pick them up. So, it's training all around for everyone on the kind of behavior. So number two. <clears throat> the ethical formation... So as a continuity, this ethical formation has to be squared in some way, psychologically, with some form of philosophical or religious environment. Why do I do this? So it gives, the fasting is linked with a larger view, oftentimes a complete world view. If I don't have the world view, I can't do the training. That's what I mentioned. So, you can't deal with the screaming in the kitchen right now, so you throw the cookie at the kid just to shut him up. Because you're not trained, he's not trained, now you're leading him on another path of not being trained. And why are we doing this? Because I can't deal with this. I just can't deal with this. And so you throw the cookie at them because you're not trained, and you're not trained because you don't have the overall vision of why you're trying to do this in the first place. And so that's why point number two is that any kind of training, any kind of escasis, has to be squared or linked in some way, not just simply to a training that we want as a practical outcome, but why is it that practical outcome is because it's some kind of either philosophical or religious environment <coughs> vision that we're trying to accomplish here. Okay? So here, it doesn't matter. It could be Christianity, it could be Buddhism, it could be all kinds of things. It doesn't make any difference. But if you don't partake in that philosophy or that religious idea, you're never going to do the training. It's just very simple. And this is why we emphasize over and over again, especially in Orthodoxy, and we used to in Catholicism, is that Catholicism is a life. It's not a speculative belief. It is a life. And if you do not live it, you're not actually being Catholic. You may have a membership originating someplace, but it's a life. It's a manner. It's a way we act. And this is purely, regardless of the truth of Catholicism or Christianity, it's just purely on the idea that you have to have some kind of reason why you're going to do this training. And therefore, some kind of philosophical or religious environment, if you like. Okay? Now, as I mentioned to you in, in the first point, when we don't have this notion of ascasis, training for some kind of behavior, everything falls apart. You don't do the training because you don't even see the goal. And I mentioned to you on the first point, if you remember, is that we said that in the Western society, because we really have no philosophical, large vision ideas anymore. Christianity has been gone for a while. And so we try to hold up to human rights and, and kind of speculative and arbitrary things, arbitrary <coughs> in the long run. Human rights are not quite. There's a book that came out about 10 years ago for the anniversary of the Declaration of the Rights of Man of the UN and um, Roosevelt's involvement, Eleanor Roosevelt's involvement with it. But what's interesting about it is to see the amount of Catholics who are actually Eleanor Roosevelt may have been the catalyst to get it going, but the number, especially South America, South America was hugely involved in making sure that there were... So it's just the idea of overall visions. 
And I bring it up because, of course, you had a lot of Catholic thinkers. Jack Merrington was one of the main involved on trying to develop a universal articulation, essentially, of the natural law. It's not Christianity, but it's hugely influenced by Christians in the 1940s still. Which is why someone like ISIS rejects the UN's Declaration of the Rights of Man and says this is not universal, this is a Christian idea, and therefore we don't see it applying to us at all, so go home. They said that back in the early 2000s when we started bombing Afghanistan. You have to educate women. They said, you're ridiculous. There's nothing, your rights of man are your thing. That's your European Christian thing. Now, when you read the news or you list, there's always, you get a little detail that will come in reporting it, and then it will be thrown off. Yes? So, like, Ataturk was very much not that way. I mean, so there were Muslims that were actually very pro-education and pro- Ataturk was culturally a Muslim, but actually he was a secular man. I mean, that, his whole purpose was to make Turkey a nationalist state. And a nationalist state means your unity is based upon some kind of ethnic origin in this case, Turkey. It had nothing to do. It happened that because this ethnic group is Muslim, it will also have an influence culturally of Islam. But that's why they had laws against wearing hijab. You weren't allowed to wear it. And Egypt did the same thing. Because they were pushing for, they were trying to follow the Western 17th, 18th, 19th century ideas of national states. And that's why now you're having this backlash, because they're saying, look, we tried your rubbish for 100 years, and it served us in no way whatsoever. All right, so this is a fascinating, what are the ideas behind the things that we do? So in the Western world, when we don't even have an idea of a goal that we're trying to accomplish anymore, we can't even decide whether a six-month-old baby in the womb is a baby or not. When we are so backward philosophically, just on the natural level, this is, I'm not talking about divine revelation. We're talking about just simply the question of what are we trying to accomplish as a community, as a culture, as a society. We can't even agree. And therefore, in the modern Western society, because we don't have any kind of sense of unified principles any longer, um, this, that community is going to find itself incapable of forming people because it won't have the ability to train them. It has no ascetic vision because it's not trying to accomplish something. If you notice, all we've argued about for the last 50 years publicly is how much you have to allow every individual to do what they wish, except insofar as it hurts somebody else. That's not a unifying principle, which is why we're arriving at the point when it's just on a mental level, on an intellectual level, it is pure chaos. Just pure chaos. Which is why, since what you think will always have an impact, see, judge, act. If your seeing as a group of people on the North American continent is chaotic intellectually, it's going to be chaotic in judgment, and it's going to finish in chaos in action. It's very logical, very simple, and no one should be surprised when it comes. Okay, so on the second point, talking about then, well, what gives us this ability to bring this unified aspect, here we can also have the negative point is that naturalism, or just pure nature, just pure nature, is insufficient for a foundational principle for any kind of escasis. Right? If anything, all that nature has been our argument about has been how each individual needs to be allowed to do what he or she wishes to do as long as it doesn't get in your face. And so the idea, of course, that's just purely on the philosophical level. Just purely the idea of nature is insufficient for a coherent vision. Okay? So that a self-defined secular community will always atomize into individuals. We'll always fragment the individual. Because if we're just talking about the individual, right? And as we mentioned last week, what the, what the interim state right now is because people don't want to be left individualized and atomized, we regroup into smaller groups. Now, historically, that regrouping was my cousins, my nieces, my nephews, my brothers, my sisters, my family, and that became your local tribe. That's why when the Roman administration in Europe began to disintegrate from the 400s, 500s, and 600s, 
But what became to replace it was localized economies based upon really clans, families. Because that's a natural linking. We're not doing that because we don't communicate at that level anymore. We communicate by social media. So our tribes are these ethereal non-reality things here and now. But the result is going to be the same. In fact, it winds up becoming worse because if it's by blood relations or by extended regional areas, at least these people are with me. You know, on social media, my on social media, my tribe is somebody in France, somebody in Argentina, somebody in China. There's not even any there isn't even a reality behind it, which also adds to that aggravating aspect of fragmentation. Okay? Are you following it so far? Yes. Yeah. All right. Number three. Therefore, any kind of post-modern, which is kind of the period we live in, what they call post-modern, any post-modern interest in spirituality must also involve some, well, first of all, any modern notion of spirituality is therefore, using the first two points we've talked about, necessarily going to be individualized and atomized. We're just going to take, a, I like this little piece here, and I like this little piece here. So I'm kind of Native American, Buddhist, Catholic, evangelical. <laughs> and that's my spirituality. I mean, you recognize it. It's why you can, I mean, it is a funny thing when you analyze it. Because it becomes absurd. Because each of those things have a coherent vision. Buddhism has a coherent vision. To just pick out, you know, calligraphy. I mean, that's fine. Then just don't call it spirituality. Say, I like Chinese calligraphy. Fine, hang it up in the house. Don't call it spirituality because you're making something which is necessarily fragmented. And of course, then any kind of involvement, but that exempts you from asceticism because you don't actually hold that worldview. You've taken only one element of it. You're not going to fast like Bodhidharma at the Shaolin Temple, right? Cutting off your eyelids so that you don't fall asleep in meditation, which is the story, all right? Or his first disciple coming who kept demanding to be taught and he kept refusing him and sending him away until the man cut off his forearm and brought it back as a presentation. Then Bodhidharma said, no, I will teach you. Now this is the man who, who is, by legend, the man who brought Buddhism from India to China. Okay, that's how it starts, all right? Now, if you really want to be a Shaolin Kung Fu Buddhist, well, then follow the whole game plan. Start to finish. Yeah. Just don't watch Kung Fu. A... <laughs> no, you know, but you know it's Shaolin. When you finish, you have to show your training by going through this huge obstacle course. And the very last thing you do, if you make it to the end of the course, they will know. Nobody even has to watch you. They will know you've made it because the very last thing you have to do is to come at the end of this hall and there's this vat of boiling oil, super hot, that has characters, Chinese characters on either side of the vat. And you have to pick it up with your forearms and lift it and it burns into your arms that you made it. That is your mark that you have accomplished your training. All right? That's why when I meet these, these, these wimpy people, well, I like this. And it's like, hey, you really, want to, you really want to be Buddhist? Let me tell you what that is. <laughs> you know, it's, we live in a fantasy world because for the moment we can. Because the power is still on and the water is still running. So we can live in this kind of airy-fairy world where we just make it up as we go along. But of course, what it comes to philosophically is that everyone creates what they call spirituality. It has nothing really to do with the fundamental philosophies or religious ideas behind them, so that what it creates is, in many cases, this idea of spirituality, is nothing other than an idiosyncratic intellectual curiosity. Right? With emphasis upon idiosyncratic. Okay? Remember, idiom, idiom in Greek means one's own, mine, idiom, 
Idiota is a person who is only locked into themselves. It often was used for the person who didn't speak another language. Idiota. They only knew their own idiom. They only knew their own idiom. So idiosyncratic means sin in the Greek is bringing things together. So idiosyncratic literally means all the things I bring together into my idiom, me. So that's what idiosyncratic means. I make it, I bring it all, and it's only unique to, to me. In using the Latin origin, we call, we refer to solipsism. Solipsism. From solus, alone. Ipsus, the same idea of being oneself. So the solipsism means something which is completely unique to myself alone. Which, of course, it has no meaning other than your own, your nonagin. It has no meaning outside of just your own little brain. So that's where this, it, it degenerates into an idiosyncratic intellectual curiositas, curiosity, not just simply inquiry. The inquiry is wonderful, but most people don't know is there is an intellectual sin called curiositas. Huh. Of just simply wanting to dally in things and read about stuff and never actually assimilating it. St. Thomas calls it the excess of intellectual activity because you're just simply titillated by stuff, but you never do anything. Because, of course, the end result of learning is you're supposed to be teaching. And so if you're just simply entertaining yourself. I remember having a colleague once, and he was brilliant on all things just historical out of World War II. I said, why don't you write some articles on this with Catholic analysis of World War II? Oh, no, 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 no. But he would sit up all night long reading books on World War II. And it's like, he was a very intelligent man. It was like the perfect expression of St. Thomas's description of curiositas. Right? So our learning is meant to be something that we eventually communicate in one way or another. And this idea of why we can live in an airy-fairy world is one of the reasons why when I was working in our school out in Idaho, the plans for the high school was to make sure that every single one of the boys, not just simply your burnouts, but every single one of your boys was going to learn carpentry skills. Because you can say all kinds of stupid things and write them on a board in a classroom and have them in your head thinking they're true. But if that table is actually not assembled correctly, it is going to fall over and drop everything on the ground. It's not even going to stand up. And everyone needs to learn that. That's why manual skills are absolutely essential for everyone to learn to one degree or the next. Not everybody needs to be a carpenter. But everyone needs to know and learn physically that all actions have consequences. And you learn that very well when you learn a manual skill. Was it an all-boys school? Yep. Yeah. yeah, we were going to develop it into the gymnasium system like we use in Europe, where from 14 you start already, from 12 and 13 you start moving them in the directions to a more academic, what we would call a prep school, and then we'd have the other boys who would still be learning all of the basic normal mathematics and everything, but would be focusing either on, on electrical work, plumbing, carpentry. Trades, yeah. But I wasn't there long enough to do it, so, yes? and explain, Father, on the difference between freedom and license? Well, license is a, is a misuse of freedom. Right. So if you use freedom in itself, it just refers to the action of being able to choose among goods. Right. So, so it, can be, it can be abused by choosing the wrong goods, but you can't judge the right or wrong goods but without having a higher vision of what they are. Right. So I, my understanding was that freedom is the ability to choose the, you know, the, to do the right thing. So objectively right. speaking, yeah. freedom is to choose among goods, specifically. Mm -hmm. If they derail us, or if we just make them all saying that they're all kind of neutral, well then you become licensed, because then you're just picking not by what they are in themselves, but just by what titillates you, or brings you your own personal idiosyncratic pleasure. Mm -hmm. So whether it's an opioid, or whether it's sex, or whether it's money, or affluence, or something. So. All right, so that's the third point. It, that's why in this postmodern, they give it a concrete application. So you do see people who fast, but what is it? It's a great cleanse. Or it's some kind of purging they'll do to empty out their innards. You know, okay, fine. But they'll do it for three days because they have a reason. They have, at least from their interpretation, have a reason to do this. But they'll show the discipline for at least for three days, four days. They'll do it. You know, 
If you need to go in for surgery, you will not eat for 24 hours or whatever it is before they tell you no eating or drinking. When we're motivated to do something, we do do it. So I said, as long as the power's on, the lights are still going, you know, we can live in, we can live in the fantasy world. But when, you know, when everything really comes up to being confronted with something, we can do this. That's why I have the total belief that everyone can practice what our ancestors have been doing for centuries. You know, these are peasant farmers. There's nothing complicated in the Maronite church. The melodies are simple. The music is sung as a unified voice. It is because it is a peasant church. It is the simple people living on the mountainsides and in the fields. It is all duplicatable. So none of it, including the fasting, is the end of the world. All right? Yes? What's the longest you've ever fasted personally? Mm. See, what do you mean by fasting in that case then? Going about, like, the colonic cleanse that people do for beauty reasons. I don't do those little, No, I know that. I mean, I eat every day. But I've never gone by not eating in a day. So you've eaten every day? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah because the idea of fasting is not to be, you know, a, a sannyasa in a Hindu, you know. It's meant to be a trained discipline of the mind and the spirit. So, so small meals, simple meals, things like that is still fasting. When you don't eat at all, or if it's just like some little bread and water, that's a black fast we call that. But black fast doesn't come up anywhere in this. Black fast would be something that people used to do historically. They would stop eating on Good Friday and Holy Saturday to commemorate. So from Thursday night until Friday, till Saturday evening, they would go just on water. That would be a black fast, but that's not required by anybody. Yes? In today's society, there's a, a, a popular way of thinking of minimalism, um, you know, doing with less. And shouldn't we as Catholics be embracing this whole mindset of not minimalism, a fasting way of lifestyle, not just with food, but with oh, possessions, sure. with... You know. That's Christian, it's on Christian virtue. Yeah, there's a modesty, there's a simplicity, there's, yeah. I mean, it spawned, it spawned Shakerism, it spawned Quakerism. I mean, it's there always in the Christian tradition, it should be practiced. Mm -hmm. It's the reason why eventually we'll talk about the these and vows and the use of you, and the dropping of these and vows. Right. Why the Quakers didn't adopt that, because they considered that pretentious. Because you is actually referring to more than one person. Thou is one person. We've dropped the use of the singular, second person. And the Quakers thought that was pretentious, because basically what you're saying, they were saying was, is you are using the royal we. It has come to our decision that we shall do this for our kingdom and our beloved subjects, that plural use. And so people started using it in the 16th century that the, that the Christian, one of the Christian movements thought was pretentious, because you're using this plural you for, you know, your kids. And they just thought that was just ridiculous. Up until the 20th century, the French were always using that plural vous amongst their equals and then would speak to their children as tu, thou. And in fact, in a conversation, when the child would speak, he'd speak to his parent as vous. But the child and the child would be referred to as tu and tu. So now it's now everyone just uses tu. The second singular, because that's what I'm talking to, is one person. So therefore, it's singular. Which is why I actually think that it should be that way in our prayers. Because it's a way that we're actually referencing, and it makes our language slightly different from what we talk in the streets. And I think liturgical language should be slightly elevated above. It should be more literary. It shouldn't be the King James Bible. I mean, that's a little bit too much. But it should have, and I, don't, I, think, I think that when you read scriptures, and that's why whenever I recommend a scripture um, translation, I always recommend one of the older ones that is still keeping thee and thou. Because now you know whether our Lord is addressing Simon Peter or all the other disciples who are standing with him as you. To say you, it doesn't make clear grammatically whether you're talking to one or to more. Right? So, yes, so it's just to give an example how even on the level of our speech, that, that pretension of the royal we and all that can also come up. But yes, everything should have a simplicity to it. It doesn't mean we all have to be, you know, monastic hermits. 
what our lives should be. I mean, you, you know, we, you can exaggerate. Every, every error comes from an, an absolutized truth. So you have Amish groups who will argue whether or you can wear dark blue suspenders or everything has to be black. And they'll have schisms and they'll break into another village and they'll move away. That's what's going to happen in unity, whether or not that colony is going to accept yellow triangles, orange triangles in the back of their buggies, because some of them accept no color whatsoever. All right, so now they're hanging lanterns. All right, so yeah, you can do this. And simplicity, St. Peter from the very beginning talks about it. Let the beauty of women be from the inside out through their virtue and not in the gold plating of their hair and in fine cloth. In other words, not superficial, but interior. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right, so but how do we get to that simplicity, paradoxically, is we implement this ascasis and we know how to be trained to do these things, okay? So... Father, th yes. this may not be the time to do this, but I know as an adult, I'm beginning, the more I listen to you, I'm beginning to see how I wasn't trained. And so, as an adult, how do you go back and recreate some of that discipline as an adult? I mean, that's a tough thing to make that together. I would say, the two basic things on there is one, adopt as much as we can to a <coughs> regime, I would say, a regime of prayer and a regime of fasting. So that we do it to the degree that we can, our health, our age, whatever. So that, but, it's, but it's truly a regime. I do this each day, or I do this each time, so many times per week. And then for the things that I cannot go back and fix, I need to cross the Jordan. I need to be married of Egypt, and I need to make reparation for the dumb things I did 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And that's why, you know, Mary of Egypt is sanctified. She destroyed a lot of people in Alexandria. She destroyed, for heaven's sakes, pilgrims on the way to right. the Holy Land. Right? I mean, that part of the story. But that is human nature, right? You know, you got the bored husband who's going on it. My wife really wanted to go on this pilgrimage. I really don't want to. Oh, who is she? <laughs> I didn't know she was coming. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, you know. So she knows in that moment when she can't walk through the doorway, she all of a sudden, remember that idea when I've talked about several times about the moment of death, you're no longer distracted? So the moment she's standing there and she is the only person isolated in that doorway when everyone's walking by her, I mean, they're all going to be noticing anything. They're like, why is that lady standing in the middle of the door? She's the only one who realizes I can't step past this. And that's what makes her, in her isolation, come to the realization of who she is. That's why the silence is so much part of our prayer life and especially at Lent, right? So what you, what you wind up finding is you have a lot of people who will not take the first step. They don't, I don't need to pray more, I'm fine. Jesus loves me. Because they don't want the next step to actually let Jesus talk to them and tell them what the next step needs to be. They don't want it, so they just keep the world going the way it's always going, and they think that when they die, everything's gonna be good because they've been telling themselves for 60 years, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, meaning God loves me just the way I am. That's an illusion. I mean, we have the quotation from our Lord when he says, unless you do penance, you shall likewise perish. It's not to sound nasty, it's just to say, our Lord, because he loves us, wants us to enter into wisdom. And so for that part, for the things I cannot fix for what I did in 1974, I do reparation, I cross the Jordan. And if I need to fit, and then I have to figure out personally for me what would be a specific training, a scasis, penance that would be proportionate to what I did do that I need to correct. So, Mary of Egypt, who had plunged herself into the fine world of wines and good food and fine silks and everything else in Alexandria, walked out until her clothes became tattered and she became naked, isolated from all of the people on a life of prayer. But we know that she's a prophetess because she knows those of his name when he appears in the desert. So we know nothing else about her life that happens in five decades, 47 years. But we do know that this woman profoundly entered into the divinity. She's an example for the, well, she's been an example for every generation, which is why she's so popular, uh, especially among the Eastern churches, but even in the Western church. There's stained glass windows of Mary of Egypt in the Cathedral of Auxerre in France, in medieval. <coughs> very popular. I'm curious. 
Has anybody heard she of her before it. he told you about her? Never. No. Anybody? No. no. So now heard. you're beginning. Well, good. Well, in this, not good in the sense that, well, better late than never, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but good in the sense that hopefully you begin to appreciate that's part of the Eastern tradition. These stories, this heritage. There is a book by a, a, an Anglican nun called Benedicta Ward. And it's a book called The Harlot of the Desert. <coughs> You'll give me a whole book on like five major stories of the great penitents, Mary of Egypt being one of them. Yes. On uh, Kathy Lee and Hoda this morning, there was a woman who sang a song called God Who Sees. And it was specifically about her and that Kathy Lee Gifford and this woman are actually creating a movie which will come out on the 5th about her in the desert. Oh. About Mary of Egypt. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> wow. Yes. Um, so what Steve was mentioning, is, isn't that kind of like a form of self-parenting? Where you well, kind of raise yourself I would call it, I would just call it maturity. I wouldn't, parenting, so, it, it, you're making, we're making a division in ourselves which isn't there. I would just say it's the person maturing. Because you're also making reparations. So, Remember, parenting means you're nourishing. Mm -hmm. That's what the word actually refers to. So the idea of nourishing it and educating, bringing out of immaturity. But a person who comes to a knowledge and wisdom, that's just something maturation. Well, I was thinking more along the lines of like where if you've got gaps in your knowledge, you kind of have to go back to school. It's almost like a, like a self-parenting where you're, you're figuring out what your curriculum should have been and then sure. going through it. But remember, the first step in that is not the filling in the holes. The first step is I've come to realize that there's holes, and that's wisdom. Yes, finally. She's been such a good, she's been holding up her hand the whole time, and so quietly in the corner. Um, I think for me, uh, it's important for me, like with Steve's question about going back and thinking about things in the past, and, um, I think it's important for me, and perhaps you could comment, that we, I always have to remind myself that it's only by God's grace that I can you know that I can accomplish. I can't do it in myself, and if because if I depend on doing it in myself, I'm going to fail, and then I'm going to say, well, no, I can't do this. But even to just begin to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, I need your grace to help me do this. That's part of the spiritual maturation. That's why as we go into this and start looking at the fasting, fasting cleanses the mind. Forget about doing some great purge. Fasting cleanses the spirit. You begin to see more clearly. Now, you know, three weeks ago, I talked about the whole thing of how I hated the silence when I first... But once you persevere at something, you come to the break point. And I will tell you that spiritual, in spirituality, true Christian living, there is the runner's high, but you have to be able to train yourself to be able to run long distance. The problem is, is that the average Catholic, if not completely dead, is an infant, completely. St. Paul talks about it in the Hebrews. I can't even teach you. I can't even give you the true meat, the red meat, because you're still babes who only can take milk, not puking up everywhere. You know, you try to feed a baby, and you know, up it comes. And so that on the spiritual level. So yes, absolutely. So what you're saying there is, you know, when someone comes to the point of realizing what our Lord says in the Gospel, saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, you do not live, and without me it is impossible. Yeah. St. Paul is saying, without faith it is impossible to please God. Well, faith is not a speculative thing. I mentioned in the bulletin last week, where we just know the Jesus story. You know, Hindus know the Jesus story. They celebrate Christmas in India. But it has nothing to do with the revelation of God entering the world in a definitive moment. It's just fun. Pretty light. Who doesn't like sparkly lights? You know. It was bizarre one year I went to India at Christmas time. I leave this country who can't, you know, that was back in the 90s too, you know, you're really just season's greetings, you know, happy snow. And so I, and I get to India and everywhere is hung up all over the place in Hindu India. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. It's everywhere among the palm trees and everything else. And you're like, this is, we live in such a perverse world. You know, so the, the pagans are actually celebrating with great exuberance. The Japanese, the Japanese love Christmas. The Japanese love Christian weddings. They'll give $5,000 to a church so they can do a 
Christian wedding in the church because they like the setting and she wants the white dress. Because that's what Christianity means to them. All trappings and props. Which is tragic. You know, if you've met real Christians, you know that it's more than props. Right? Cardinal Bigenti spending years you know, locked up at the embassy. He had those props. You know? At first he was in prison. Okay? So you have all of this ask. I just want to do point four before we um, we'll take, a, we'll take our break. Which is why then to bring it all into these, the first three points, to bring it to the, the point D, or the fourth point if you want, is that of the, of the Syriac tradition of Ihidoyuto. And we talked about it last year, the Ihidoyo. Ihidoyo, Ihidoyuto, the idea of singularity. And Ihidoyo in Syriac is the idea of being alone, one. Right? And so Ihidoyuto is the idea, oh, I even wrote it out for you in Syriac last year. We have to keep going back to everything and repeating it. We're never going to get out of this class. <laughs> oh, okay. Ihi, do, you, do. All right. Ihi, do, you, do. Ihi, do, you. All right. The part of this word, ihi, do, you, means one or alone. So, for example, in the Gospels, in the Syriac Gospel, it'll say, Ihidoyo bro. And that's what we translate as the only begotten son. But it actually means the only son, the one, without speaking about being begotten. Right. So, the Ihidoyuto. So, it's the idea of the singularity of vision. If you look through our prayers that are in our red books, and if you look at the prayers, you have a number of qualifications. It talks about the fact that in fasting, and the fasting is just an application of this singularity of vision. As Christians, we want to, you must love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole strength, with your whole mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Which means the singularity of vision has always been from the very beginning. Because, of course, our Lord quoting that is actually quoting the old law of Moses. You must love the, that's the Shema Israel. Listen, Lord, that your Lord is, that your Lord God is one God. Right? And so you shall love with one whole soul. So our Lord is saying your entire existence has to be focused upon God. That's our Lord saying this. And then elevating and saying it must encompass also those associated around you, right? your neighbor as yourself. It's very hard. You know, when we start thinking about these things at moments, they can become quite overwhelming. Okay. Now, so that's the first thing, is ihi doyuto. But what we're saying is that the fasting is an application of this. It's an ascent to the divine. There is on Tuesday Ram, uh, Tuesday Ram show in the supplication, in the boyuto, which follows the reading in the evening office, which is Monday night, but it means Tuesday round show, um, refers to that by fasting we ascend to the divine. We have received wings, and we, we are able to ascend. Right? The second point here is even in our English word, okay, we call this Lent. I mentioned to you the Saxon word Lent means spring. That's all it means, springtime. Right? So the whole notion of regeneration. Right? The great fast, the great strengthening, is the great Lent, the great rejuvenation, the great regeneration. Right? That's the second point. The third point is, is what we're doing and also is, is a domination, it's dominance over our egoism. Because I'm doing something which I see bigger than, oh, my tummy's, my tummy's growing, I'm hungry. You know, and that's it. So my stomach demands, so I go and I eat something. I stuff something in my face. Could be worse. I just stuff things in my face because I'm, you know, quasi-neurotic, and I have to always be munching on something. We know a lot of people like that. But that's the kind of that's the society that we live in, right? We are a nation of grazers, right? We're dropping all of our habits of eating three meals a day. We graze all day long. We eat chips and cookies, and then we wonder why we're all morbidly obese. The problem is, is that we've lost. The problem isn't even at the level of the health. That's an effect of a symptom of something going on much, much worse within us spiritually. You know, and I've said this numerous times. I am not unsympathetic to the fact that people are dropping white flies because of opioids. But that is a symptom of something much more profound going on. Not whether or not we hand out 
what is it, Naxone or whatever this, this drug is. I mean, those are necessary in the moment, and that's great. But that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is profound. And that's why in the vision of fasting in the Ihito Yuto, this is a way to overcome my, my, my ego, my self-centeredness, my egocentric way of existing, which is a wound and one of the primary effects of the loss of grace of Adam and Eve in paradise. And I'm only concerned about numero uno. I mean, that's just what we all do psychologically. And it's not evil in itself. It just means we have to be educated and aware of it so that we can become the people who are more than just simply self-centered. Okay? And then a fourth point is that this training, okay, to work with the training, why we do food, why we do that we do prayers in the morning, prayers at night. Why do we do this? You know, I talk to some people, like, do you do the rosary? And it's like, oh, I don't have time. It's like, that's 15 minutes. Okay, I don't have 20 minutes. I say, your, your day is so efficaciously organized that you can't find 20 minutes to contemplate the gospel. That's what you're saying, right? And, and of course, no, no, I didn't mean that. Well, okay, then in practice, what's going on here? So that in the training in these kind of short-term things of what would be our enjoyments, I just want to surf for another hour. I don't want to say the rosary. I just stay on the computer. So instead of watch television or do something else or talk on the phone or whatever or just sleep, I don't know. The training in these short-term enjoyments, and they are enjoyments, you know, looking up stuff and doing all this, that's fun. You know, intellectual curiosity wouldn't be a sin if it weren't disordered, but it means it has something pleasant in it just to kind of dabble and look at stuff, you know. And so this training in short-term enjoyments and pleasures that are coming in is for our long-term gains, which all you can just simply say is that there are gains and there are pleasures in those long-term achievements. So I use the example of the runner's high that everyone talks about, but if you're not a long-distance runner, you have no idea what they're talking about. But if you're running, then you know. But you at least believe them that there is something. You're not going to go join them in doing that. And that brings you back to the earlier point, that in doing the training, you have to have a religious or philosophical environment to choose that. The reason why you don't pursue, and I haven't pursued the runner's high, is because I don't really care. And I really don't care if I'm running. Plus, you destroy your knees you know, if you're doing all that running. So my knees will degenerate easy enough without having to slam them up and down fast, you know, for long periods of time. But the notion of a spiritual liberation, the notion of a, of a spiritual and a mental silence that can enter into us, that I think is worth gaining. And that's why in those first year, that first year and a half, you know, especially the first year at the seminar, I mean, when I told you it wasn't just to give you a story of the past, it's to say I learned. I learned at 19. One of the greatest lessons in my life, just shut up, sit at this desk, stare at the white wall, and do your homework. Yes, it's Friday night. Stop whining. There. I'm parenting myself in that by, by two-personing myself, talking to myself, sitting there at 19. But that's, that, was a great, that was a great breakthrough in wisdom, which is what prepared me three years later when they dropped me in the middle of the continent at a French-speaking seminary, not speaking any French other than we and bonjour. <laughs> but I could never have weathered that at 21 if I hadn't had the previous training. So God, God has been training us for years, but how many times we've just flicked it away because we didn't want to do it then. And if we had only started in 1984, where would we be now? If we'd only started in 1997, where would we be now? That's the way we need to see it. That will motivate us to cross the Jordan. We don't need to have it all done as a dramatic way as marriage of Egypt, but that ultimately is what brings us to the wisdom. That's what the golden years are meant for. We're no longer corralling kids. We, we have freedom in that sense personally. And it's meant to be more and more focused upon God, contemplation, and the things of God, so that I will just naturally be able to step through the veil of death when that moment comes and be happy to do so. That is wisdom. That is beauty. And that is understanding what the kingdom is, ultimately. Right? Not living in Sun City, Arizona, running around like you're still an adolescent. A goofball. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So therefore, as a conclusion here, then we'll take a break, is that our human dignity, all right, 
just on the question of discipline. Remember, we're not talking, I mean, we have been talking about the gospel in that. So it's even more of a reason as a Christian. But human dignity in itself is related to asceticism because we become masters of ourselves. Even just on the purely natural level. None of us like that second cousin we have who's a deadbeat still living at the age of 65 in his mother's basement, who's never done anything. Because we realize you were never able to come out of the basement because you never mastered yourself to be able to step out into the light. And so we have that understanding of it. So even just the level of discipline is our human dignity is related to asceticism. Then when you add the grace of faith and everything, then it becomes a flourishing of the transformation of the martyrs, the saints, the prophets, and all of these great, wonderful people who have preceded us, giving us the example, saying, you know, you can do this too. Look, if a tramp from Alexandria can finish as a great mystic, what's the, what's the excuse for the rest of us? I mean, to put it in that way, I remember once I gave a sermon on this in the beginning of my priesthood. And I used the word whore in the pulpit. One lady, she kind of had a meltdown. But, <laughs> but you know, because what I did, it was a punchline. It was the punchline. It was the conclusion at the end of saying, so look, if the whores and the harlots can enter into the brilliance of a prophetic life of transformation, do any of us have an excuse for not getting there? Mm. So this woman didn't hear what I was saying. She just focused on the vocabulary of one word. You know, it's like a big letter. You should never say this. Or, I'm sure your children hear worse things in the street. Okay, so, um, yeah. All right, we'll take a bit of a break then. What was the talk On the natural level, then we talked about this different aspects. And so, of course, when we add the question of grace and faith, then, you know, the human dignity is not just human dignity. That's the natural law. That's just simply, you know, the declaration of the rights of man and that. That human dignity aspect is what we can know about by using our noggins and God's creation. That's basically what we call the natural law. The natural law is human reasoning, human understanding of just simply nature as nature. But of course, as Catholics, Revelation, we know that that nature is also wounded. You know, it's never going to be sufficient or glorious or whatever. You know, it'll be glorious at certain moments, but it's never going to overall be sufficient. So, in the Ihi Doyuta, we talked about the fact now with the question of the faith, that it clarifies the mind, it strengthens our volition, the act of choosing, the will, it strengthens the will. In the mere psychological aspect that we're disciplining ourselves. Okay? The third thing that we wind up getting in our prayers is that it purifies the body. It brings chastity to the body. Okay? And remember, chastity is not... It's, you know, in the modern world, the problem is, is that all the vocabulary has been destroyed. So when you use the word chastity, it means a prude who thinks sex is evil, which is not what chastity means. Chastity is related to the word chaste, chasten, chastity. It's the idea that you discipline. And you're disciplined so that you use your body for its full beauty. Now, St. Thomas, I've mentioned to you, I think, St. Thomas has the question of when he does this, treats on the section of the fall of Adam and Eve, when he did fall of Adam in paradise, he asks the question whether or not the relations of husband and wife would have been better before the fall or after the fall. And he says, well, they were better before, they would have been better before the fall. Because there, the entire mind, affection, Love, clarity, emotion, and physical pleasure would have all been completely unified person to person. And therefore the relation would have been much more profound, much more beautiful, and much more ultimately by the grace that they were in, transcendent. Ah, you know, that's a really interesting way of looking at the world. So that once original sin introduces, you know, human beings grab on to oftentimes, you know, and especially in the modern world, one physical aspect of sexuality. You know, from that point of view, Mary of Egypt is a very modern example. Because she, you know, she said she would take money on occasion if she had to live, but she just was into it because she just really had fun and she just really loved this. You know? It's a very modern woman. You know? And so that's why the third point is that it purifies the body. It, it, it brings chastity. 
And everyone in the world has to be chaste. It's not just simply monks and priests and sisters. Chastity is just simply the virtue of living according to your state, right? Celibacy means you're not married. It's two completely different things, okay? Um, so therefore, the last point is that it regulates, it regulates all the passions. That emotional surge that makes me be dragged around by my stomach or whatever it is, or by moodiness, or whatever it is. It regulates those emotions, regulates those passions. And a fifth point is that it brings pardon to sin. This we know from scriptures. You wouldn't know that on a natural level. But fasting, because in the book of Tobias, in the Tabuka, book of Tobias, we're told fasting is to sin as water is to fire. Now that's just part of the scriptures in the book of Tobias. So we wouldn't know that if it wasn't revealed to us in this sacred text. Right? Because psychologically at a level, we can see all the other reasons we gave in the first three points about discipline and an ethical way of directing and moral action. We can see all that on the natural, just simply philosophical level. But the notion that somehow they extirpate our past misactions, we wouldn't know that if it wasn't revealed to us. But we know by that revelation, we know that fasting is a way of extirpating our past mistakes and sins. Yes? In the, in the, um, the story that where our Lord uh, cast the demon out and the de disciples said, you know, they asked ask him questions about it. He said, this one can only be done by pray much prayer and fasting. fasting. What is the connection between fasting and being able to cast out demons from this person? This is going to come in if we get to it. If oh, not, okay. we'll do it next week on the um, Yesharim, the doctrine of the two spirits. Okay. So seven in the Semitic idea of plenitude. So the person becomes worse because there is... Yesha, there is um, an inclination that comes back to them that is worse from before. Because the man ultimately in that story has never, oh, I'm sorry, in the other parable. The other right. parable is that some inclinations are stronger than others. And if there's not the prayer, this connection with the divine, and the discipline on a personal level, you're just always going to be under the influence of this inclination. Because, it, you know, for the Jews, the Jews, even today, they don't really have an idea that the devil is person. Because in the doctrine, the Essene doctrine of Yesharim, the word Yeshar is translated in the, when it comes into the Greek as an inclination. But it becomes in Christian, in Jewish Christianity, the notion of two spirits. So kind of, you know, the way of the idea is that there is a spirit behind each of the seven capital sins. So seven comes up again there. And each of the spirit, the spirit of lust, the spirit of avarice, that way of speaking is coming out of Jewish Christianity. And so some inclinations, some yesha, are more profound, and each individual will be different. So some individuals will have to wage a battle more with one specific type of demon, one specific type of spirit or inclination more than others, yes. Well, I know uh, priests that are, have been given the, the ministry of exorcism really have to spend lots and lots of time pray, in prayer and fasting and to, to come against these things. Yeah. They have, they can't yeah, because they need to, because they have to be basically, you know, in the image of the Greeks, they basically have to be the stripped naked wrestler. Because anything that's, a, anything that's in their life that's still out of whack, big or small, the demonic can use it see, and then trip them up. That's why, you know, the Greeks were naked. You don't have to hang on to it. Right? <coughs> and you grease them down like chasing a grease pig, right? So boil them down and just strip them naked. So that, and that's really what the exorcist has to be, is strip naked, clean before God, so there's no, nothing they grab onto. And then you wage this combat. Which is what the word agony actually means. <coughs> agony means struggle. It doesn't mean you're dying. Agonia is, is, a, is a struggle. So our Lord's agony in the garden is his struggle before the beginning of all of this event that leads into his death. Agonia. Alright. So, like I said, the idea of pardoning of sin, that's part of revelation. But one of the things it also does that we don't often think about is fasting renews social relations. When we purify our minds and domesticate our passions and our emotions, and we become masters of ourselves, it puts us that much further 
to actually rectifying the grudges, the misunderstandings, the friction, and all the other problems that just simply come into human life. So when a person who fasts has a much greater chance of actually, by being masters of themselves and cooperating with God's grace, renewing social relations. So one of the greatest things that can happen in the world is if you had more people fasting on the supernatural level. That's in the article on the frustration of the incarnation. Remember, lines, lines, of, lines of penitence across the interstate system of the United States fasting and refusing to eat anything other than the crust that are thrown out by the passers-by, you know, the tourists going by in their cars. Mm -hmm. there's, a book, there's a series of books coming out in the future. I gave a, a one of the, the first volume I gave um, to Doreen to read through. But the frustration of the incarnation is probably one of the finest articles in that first volume. Yes? I uh, just want to make sure I'm making the right connection or association. So, for example, like where you're talking about having, uh, uh, you know, just absolute silence. And, like, just for example, when I went on a uh, three-day retreat, and it was a uh, silent retreat, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but the one thing I noticed was as soon as I went out of the gates of Manresa in uh, Bloomfield, Michigan, uh, mm -hmm. actually West Bloomfield, Michigan, that as soon as I went out of the gates, it was amazing how noisy the world was. Yeah, you notice it much more. But I'm just but wondering that's when why, to, I'm wondering when, when you do to. the exercises, mm -hmm. so in my congregation, we did a five day format. The last meditations, the last <coughs> contemplations, are St. Ignatius teaching you how to re enter the world and retain those exercises that you've just been doing for, well, originally 30 days for a whole month. But this case, but I want to make sure I'm making the right connection. So in other words, basically, it's kind of linked to the fasting where once you get your body to shut up about being constantly hungry and trying to distract yeah. you, that that's where the... the St. John Climacus, whose feast day is this coming Sunday on the 7th, he says, when you discipline yourself this way, you become a natural faster. Mm -hmm. Because after a while, you've, you've curbed your appetite. You've mastered it. Which is why when, again, you read the lives of the saints, some of them do these really incredible amounts of penance is because they've been training for 40 years. You're never going to start where they're at at the end of that ruckus you know, because they've been training for that length of time. That's why it's important when you read the lives of the saints you understand what's going on. Or, you know, St. John Climacus in the, the, the Divine Ladder is, you know, the classic book on penance. But he talks about that. And so the same way, once you've assimilated sound, once you've assimilated the silence and, and your interior is silent, the world is nothing but cacophony. Yep. Right. And the deeper, the same way on an analysis, the deeper that you have assimilated beauty, then everything looks uglier and uglier. Have you ever thought of doing like a, you know, like a, a weekend or a three-day retreat where you, you start with basically... Uh, I'd I would like to actually take, but I have to find a place where we can rent, where you can each have individual rooms. Mm -hmm and do the five-day exercises. Begin on Monday afternoon and finish on Friday afternoon of full silence and take you through the Ignatian method to teach you. And as a Jesuit, to teach you how to teach you so that you could teach and follow it after, not just simply follow it. Something like that I'd love to do, but, I, but the, thing, the only thing is, is I'd have to either like bring a camper so I could bring the cats that I'm responsible with. You can't do cats because they're distracting. <laughs> That's called a babysitter. Silence has to be pure, perfect silence. Now That's I'm the heart. exact opposite. I need noise. He knows. I've even got the TV on. I've got a radio going on. I so what are you need... afraid of? I don't know. I'm not afraid of much. I mean, we've had, I mean, we've had our house. If you haven't entered into full, perfect silence, then there's something that's holding you back. I mean, we've had our houses Some, something, broken into, and I'm front upstairs looking you. for the burglar. Right, and... There's something still snagging you. Only when we have the serenity of entering into the science. You know, and again, we talked about a natural level and the philosophical view. You know, in, in um, Tantrakana, in, in, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, you'll do a three-year retreat in the mountains and not speaking at all for three years, walled up on the side of the cliff. I can tell you what I think a lot of people's, uh, uh, people are afraid of, but they might not know it. Depression. No, but a lot of people are afraid of what they don't know. People know that in the few moments when things have been quiet, we know my mind goes all over the place. 
So now you go into it by perfect choice for five days. That's why I mentioned, I think I mentioned in the pulpit, you know, we'll have the beginning of a retreat, and it was not unusual. It didn't happen every retreat. But you may have 25, 30 men show up or 25, 30 women, and you, know, you have one disappear or two disappear uh, before Monday evening because they can't even handle the first three hours. Was not, it was not common, but it was not unexpected. Because even just the three hours waiting for everything to start as you're unpacking and putting your things into your little closet. Because this is the seminary, you know, so you get to see what the seminarians have on their, you know, 12 by 15 room or whatever it is, with a bed in it and a sink. And this is your room, welcome to the seminary, and will you start the silence now? People used to visit the seminary, they'd freak out because, of course, the seminarians all knew the seminary, right? So we never, we did not often turn on the lights, we just walked down the hallways. Yeah, the emergency lights on, that was enough light to walk around. But of course, we're, 60 of us are all in black cassocks, right? So if somebody was visiting, you <laughs> we to hear this howl because they, because you also train to walk quietly, to shut a door quietly. Your goal is to be that the person in the room next to you, in a building of concrete and terrazzo and marble, doesn't know you're in there. Which means you don't drag your chair across the ground, you pick it up and put it underneath your desk. But it's more than and that, that in itself is a training. That, that's actually what Special Forces try, attempts to do, yeah. is to train people so that you can't even feel anything right. in the room. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the idea of the training, and that's why, you know, for us it's seven year formation. So I had Marines come in to me and say, I have to go, Father, I have to leave. Because yeah. I was Vice Rector, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, this is, this is too much. And I said, well, you're a Marine, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, no. And one of them was fascinating because the one of them said to me, yeah, yeah, he says, I have the greatest respect for you guys now. He said, and he said, yeah, but as a Marine, we get leave. When <laughs> <laughs> you're off the base, yeah. but this is 24 hours a day for the rest of your life, I can't do this. You know, which I found I had never thought about that. I thought, you know, hey, because a lot of times when you have seminarians leave, their disposition usually, they, a lot of them will go off and become a cop, or they'll go into the military, because they want still some kind of order, especially if they've done it for two or three years. You know, you're always up at this time. I mean, our idea of sleeping in is that on Sunday we slept in 30 minutes more than the rest of the week. You know, so, that type of a thing. But these are all little details. Yes, but I would love for us to arrive at a point that I could take, you know, eight people, ten people, whatever. But we have to find a place where we have eight rooms that can be isolated. You know, you can't, sharing rooms is never good for this, you know, because then you're in there talking in the bathroom and sharing sinks, and it's just like, well, forget it. Uh, the seminary, you had the showers that were common, but in your room you had all your water, you had the sink and all that. I can so. tell you one place where you can funk. Yeah, so we were, we're looking for something where we can have that individuality and we can also set up a chapel. Then I think, then those, when you start going deep into these things, you know, as they say, the sky is the limit, you know, that, then it becomes a question of holiness. And we never become holy enough. You can reach a point where your fasting is about as much as you can do, you know, but you can never say that I'm holy enough. So, so the last point here, is that when you take all of these ideas, clarifies the mind, strengthens volition, purifies the body, regulates the emotions, the passions, brings part in the sin, renews social relations, you can see that the strengthening of the individual, it's a strengthening of the individual, we become masters of ourselves, it necessarily strengthens the family. You know, the family, you know, you know Father Peyton's, the family that prays together stays together. The family that also fasts together forms a cohesion of learning how to practice. And your children from the largest, you know, from the smallest point, from the youngest point, begin to enter into Christianity in a very practical and real way. And so it restores the family also in a very real way. And of course the community all in relation to God because in order to apply these measures, we're doing them because we have a larger vision than whether I'm eating grapes or not or whether I'm eating so much or not. The point is I'm doing these things, whether I'm eating between midnight and noon. I'm doing these things for a larger vision. And that's why it has all this restorative aspect. So the thing that we can finish up on this part is that without ascetic concentration of effort, without the ascetic concentration of effort, 
One is at the mercy of exterior forces. If we refuse to be masters of our own interior, then we will be led by the exterior, necessarily. And so that image of this demon can only be cast out by prayer and fasting has that aspect of understanding that if we are not masters individually of ourselves, ultimately in the gospel, as a vine grafted into, a branch grafted into the vine, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, then of course we're going to be led by exterior things. That is why when I talk about the social relations here and the coherence, to the degree that the members of that community also have that mastery, then that community has its own self-mastery and is that much less susceptible to demagoguery or pure passionate screaming. And you can see by the way that our national conversation goes on how undisciplined and how unregulated and how not masters of themselves are the most part, you know, all our fellow citizens. Not all of them, but, you know, a lot, clear enough to have screaming going on 24 hours a day. And that's why with the social media possibility of being anonymous, you just cut loose. You know, because they don't see you. Things that you would never say to the person across from the table, you just type out. You don't really care. Okay? So that's why this idea that it, the le to the degree that we are masters through this discipline, we are less susceptible of being guided by exterior forces, but without this concentration, that we're at the mercy of either exterior forces or our own whims. All right? That experience of, I can't deal with this, it's overwhelming, so I'm going to take a nap. Right? <laughs> the national, again, for, I don't like the term epidemic, but this national disaster of depression, this is another one linked with the opioid things. This, there are physical, mental illnesses. And then there are a lot of just simply undisciplined and untrained people who just simply haven't been educated, okay? Now, I'm not a physician, so I can't discern which of the, the depression cases are clinical, true medical cases, and doubtless there are many of them. But I would presume, I would assume that not all of them are organically generated. Right? In the sense that they just happen to me. Right? A lot of them come because I just, everything becomes overwhelming and insurmountable if I have no discipline within myself to overcome obstacles. This is part of the escape training to be able to have a goal of the way we're going to act. And so we either become at the mercy of our exterior, exterior forces or of our own capriciousness, our own caprices. That's why I always use the image of the two-year-old, because the two-year-old is the perfect expression of a human being. There are very sweet moments, and then there are just absolutely demonic meltdowns. <laughs> and that is the human being. That is the Yeshua. This is the two spirits. These are the things, the influences that we live under. And if we don't train to live by the good spirit, then the demonic, takes over. That's the tantrum in blue in the faith. It doesn't mean preternaturally demonic. It just means this kid has no control over himself. I've told you about when I was working in Missouri, one of the families, one of the men was telling me about, I don't know, it was his sister-in-law or something. They didn't come to the parish. I don't know who they were. I never met them. But he was telling me, you know, 25 years ago about this ordeal where this woman, he didn't know what to do with his mother, with his, his wife's sister-in-law, so it's like by marriage, so her brother, you know, so an extended family. Because this relationship had come to the point where this 15-year-old girl, 15 years old, would do the same tantrums she had been doing since the age of two, and throw herself on the ground and scream, and as I asked him, and I said, and her mother always <coughs> gave in, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I said, well, that's why. That's their modus operandi. She wants something, mom says no, and then she screams and says, but this is ridiculous, 15, come on. You know. So doubtless, 25 years ago, that woman is close to 40 now, and doubtless still living in her mother's basement, and who knows, maybe even throwing tantrums at the age of 40. 
That is so pathetic, and that mother will go to hell. Because you didn't give anything to that creature. It's like the other, another man was telling me about his sister-in-law who used to feed her children Skittles and Pop in the morning. Pop, I mean, that's the Middle Western. Soda. You know? Because the kids complained, that's what they wanted. So she just gave in to them. They let them eat whatever they wanted in the morning. So they ate Skittles and soda before they went to school. She's destroying them. Because she didn't want to deal with them. So now you see, remember we talked about the relation of the woman who had the cold father, who found out that the father, the grandfather was a bootlegger? So this woman's lack of control herself has now passed on to the next generation, the 15-year-old who throws herself on the ground. And doubtless, this woman will go out and be the famous unwed mother who will pop out five or six kids from five or six different men. And then we're supposed to, as a community, figure out how that's supposed to fix it. And it's like, well, you fix it, you know, 30 years ago. There's something else going on here. You know? And then those children will receive an education which just propagates this. It just spreads like wildfire. This is tragic. This is why when you read Brave New World, everyone's just drugged. Habitually, you just drug everybody. But the state talks about how peaceful it is. Because <coughs> everyone's just on soma, everyone's on narcotics. Okay? So what I, this whole section on asceticism is that is not human dignity. That is not human freedom. That you just live in a society where everyone gets an opioid ration every week. That but you can see how we could arrive there. When it was written in the 1930s, everyone thought Aldous Huxley was a nut. That would never happen. I mean, we written every detail in that book we can recognize now. That the word mother, the word father are obscene words. No one mentions them. You can see how easily we are almost at that point now. We just have parents. Right? You just had on the news today the homosexual couple, same-sex marriage, that one of these men's mother just gave birth to her granddaughter through in vitro fertilization, then implanted in a 61-year-old mother's wombs, who gave birth to a child which was joined in a laboratory between his semen and the sister of his husband. <laughs> and you're like, really? <coughs> How do you even begin to disentangle this socialism? Because the point is, is that we have a right to have a baby. Right, right, you know, it means if somebody has to give you a child somehow, anyway. Yeah. So, that makes a child but mentally, body. that's why on this discipline, the ihi do yuto is the question of vision ultimately. I had a question when I read about that this morning. When you manufacture a child like that, I'm sorry? When you manufacture a child outside of a natural relationship, does God have a compulsion to instill a soul? No, oh, he's created he's created nature. So they figure out a way to make nature work. So you know, but we forget for that one <coughs> child that actually comes to birth, you've had numerous fertilized ova that have been destroyed or killed or because you know you don't fertilize just one egg. You, know, you have a whole petri dish full of them. But will that child have a soul? Well, of course. Oh yeah. It will. I feel sorry for the social condition that this child is going to be reared in, but... But when you do it like that, it's making a child a commodity rather than... Oh, that. yeah, that's been going on. We've been doing that since the early 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, there were all kinds of, you know, convulsions going on in the medical world when we started opening plasma centers. Mm -hmm. Because once you started being, you know, the people off the winos off the street or the homeless people, whatever you want to call them, could sell for 20 bucks, you know, a pint of blood, and then they reduce it to and then sell it off. You had, you know, the AMA and the Medical Association was, was furious. There were, there were federal cases on that back in 1961-62. But since that time, human beings are just a commodity. Yeah, it's just... So, let's finish this up. So this, this vision is much larger than whether we eat uh, scallops on Friday or whether we have sushi on Tuesdays of Lent. This vision is much, much larger and wide, which is why I wanted to take and do this aside on what the whole idea of asceticism is. You know, so that we come, that either we will be then victims of, or not victims, we will be subject to exterior forces or our own whims and emotions and moods, or more likely a combination of both. So 
So then what happens is our life becomes a series of reacting rather than acting. We're only acting according to what's happening outside of us or whatever's churning around inside of me. So my action is no longer, because I'm not a master of myself, I'm not acting in any way, I'm reacting to whatever's happening. Okay? You know, and it can be on all kinds of things. This is where, you know, the, the, the porn addictions and everything come in. It's glued to the screens. And everyone thinks it's a men's problem, but statistically women come out close to about as much as men these days. You know? you know, They used to say, well, men are visual, so men do all of these things. And women, well, they're still better at this. But statistically, they know, right? Because they know your gender. And they can monitor all of this. They don't know your specific name, but they can monitor all just simply by the flow that goes on the internet. They know. They'll, they could point out to say, what is the percentage of households on the internet using this, you know, in Lewiston, as compared to Portland. They compare all of these things, they have all of this data, it's absolutely extraordinary. And it's absolutely extraordinary, we just hand it all over. That's what I find so amazing. I mean, I use the internet, but I use it as little. I mean, when they give you that weekly thing that tells you how long you've been on your screen, you've been down, you've been up 148, per, this was last week, You've been up 148% this week to eight minutes a day. <laughs> yeah, but then I, I refuse to be mastered by electronics. Absolutely refuse. I'm always at the verge of actually even just shutting down the whole television. I don't even watch on it, PBS and BBC. You know. But not yet, because if we turn it off, the next priest won't have a television because he's going to have to say, well, you need to. No, no, we're not paying for that. <laughs> you don't need that. It, it does provide information appropriately. Yeah, but I can get that on my, my iPad. That's true. Yeah. I don't have to have a TV. I can still have just the Internet. Anyway, so, if, so the finish with this, if one is not a master of himself, then he does not arrive in on the natural level to the full dignity that a human being should have. So when one is not a master of himself, we realize then that only the ascetic person is truly free. It doesn't mean a hermit on the mountainside, but the ascetic person, you know, the day laborer, you know, the mother, the father, only since the question of the self-mastery then only the ascetic person is free. So next week, we're going to talk about how does this come into the condition with Adam and his fall. Okay? Because and we'll give you a heads up on it, is that if you read St. Ephraim, St. Ephraim emphasizes that the going after the fruit is the fact that they eat without giving thanks. Which links right away to, you know, my self-interest. Remember the Curie of ours. The Curie of ours said that the person who begins a meal without grace or blessing is no different than the animal at the feeding trough. Food's here. <laughs> it's true. And by on that last point, on the practical thing, the incorrupt heart and the reliquary of the same of the Curie of ours will be at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception on April 23rd. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, if you want, maybe we trans, it's a Tuesday. Maybe we might transform Tuesday into a trip, if you think about going down to Portland to see the, the reliquary in ours. That's quite a gift to come. Say that again. April 23rd. April 23rd, which is Easter Tuesday in Bright Week. It will be there from 4 p.m. <coughs> to the Bolton this week between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. on April 23rd. Okay. All set. We'll finish up with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. O God, who are before all ages, and is the age to age, you are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer your praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah. To him, with you, and the Holy Spirit, 
glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray, pray for us and have recourse to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Have a good evening. Beautiful to see you all. Buy the rest of the books, because there are only 20 books this week. So. Are those the, are they transistors? Yeah, that, they list as ten of them. Yes. Um, is it the same one? No, no. no, 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 no. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, so they're a house. No, it's on the other one.